In this video, we're going to look at the shapefile format. It's a bit of a legacy format, but it's still very relevant today, and it does form an important part of the development of GIS. So it was launched at a similar time as Esri's ArcView in the early 90s, and ArcView was a desktop-based GIS application. It had a graphical user interface, and before that, you had to type in command line instructions. So GIS was, had quite a steep learning curve, and ArcView and Shapefiles was a move where GIS becomes simpler, easier to use, easier to collaborate, and is a key to the expansion of GIS, or the expansion of the use of GIS. So Shapefiles store vector data, so points, lines, and polygons, and Shapefiles was a simpler, more user-friendly format than the previous Arc Info coverages. The details of the Shapefile format was published in 1998, and this allowed other non-ESRI software producers to create shapefiles. And this was to encourage interoperability. And the format effectively becomes public. And this is the key to shapefile success and its wide-scale adoption and why it's still relevant today. So let's have a look at the format. So if we look at a shapefile in GIS software, we're just going to see one file. But in fact, the shapefile is made up of at least three files. So if we look at that, we've got the .shp, and this is the binary files that stores the spatial data. And I have been sent this in the past with somebody trying to share data. They just send you this one file and it won't work. You've got to have at least these three mandatory files. And as GIS is the principle of combining spatial features with data, and it's what makes GIS much more than just a map. We need the database component. And what they did is they adopted the most widely used database format at the time, which was a dbase file, and it's got the extension .dbf. So this holds all the data, all the attributes associated with the spatial data. And it's gonna give us our table and our columns from our table in GIS. Now, what's interesting about this dbase file is you can, because it's a, an open source format, you can just drag it into Excel um, or you could use it in Microsoft Access. And from here, you can edit the attributes directly. So this can be uh, quite useful if you're doing a lot of editing on an attribute table. It might be easier to do it in Excel or something like that rather than trying to edit in uh, GIS itself. So then the third file is this .shx file, and this is the indexing file, and that links those two other files together. So it's what links the spatial features with the corresponding records in the attribute table. So those are the three compulsory files. So you've got to have at least those three, but you can have more. Software packages may produce these other files to store things like indexing and metadata info. And the most important optional file is the .prj file, because this holds the projection information. And if we want to share a shape file or load it into a different project, if it's missing the .prj file, then we won't know the projection. We might not be able to get it to plot in the right place. So you could argue it shouldn't be optional at all, but it is. If we go back to our ArcGIS Pro project, we had this shape file in this project of these railway lines, it didn't have a .prj file, so it, no projection information is stored in the shapefile. So in Pro, if we wanted to add that to the shapefile, we would do that through a geoprocessing tool, and we would go to the define projection geoprocessing tool. And it's just the same as we would if we were adding information to a feature class. We just add the shapefile to the tool, and then we define the projection. In this case, we're just gonna define it as the same as the current map. And then we run that tool. And what that will do is that will create that .prj file. And if we look at that in Windows Explorer, just ignore the lock files. Those are temporary files. Those will disappear once the project is closed. Those are just controlling uh, right access to the shape file. We have the .prj file, and it's just a text file. Uh, you can actually open the .prj file uh, to view the contents to see that projection definition. 
So how would we create a shapefile in ArcGIS Pro? Uh, well, the easiest way is to go to the catalog, go on the folder, right click and new and shapefile, and that will open the geoprocessing tool. It's the create feature class geoprocessing tool. Uh, in, but in this case, we're gonna create a shapefile. And provided it's pointing to a folder, rather than a geodatabase, you will create a shapefile. And we just need to give it a name, decide the geometry type, whether it's a point, line, or polygon. Again, shapefiles can only hold one geometry type per shapefile. And we can define the coordinate system. Again, this is optional, probably shouldn't be, but it is. Uh, you cannot define the fields in the attribute table from the geoprocessing tool. You need to do that after. This is different than QGIS, but you'd have to do that later. Then run the geoprocessing tool and that will create the shapefile. Now, if we look at that in Windows Explorer again, once again, ignoring the lock files, which have been blurred out, we'll see we get more than the mandatory three files. We're getting the .prj because we did define the coordinate system and we're also getting extra indexing and metadata files which Pro has created so that those are available for use. And you can edit shapefiles in Pro just as you would a feature class just from the edit ribbon. So let's have a look at QGIS. So it's pretty similar to Pro. If we want to create a shape file, we'd go to the browser and go on the folder and then right click new and shape file. And that's going to open up the tool to create a shape file. So we give the shape file a name. And we do have this no geometry option, which we don't have in Pro. And so this will effectively just give us a table. So no spatial data. And then it is mandatory in Pro to create a spatial reference, which is better, I think. So we will get that .prj file. And what we can do here, uh, unlike Pro, is we can define the fields for the attribute table up front. So we just give it a name, add the fields, define the data type for those columns, and, and do that, all of that up front. It can be done later if you want. Uh, further fields can be added. And in QGIS, we'll get the four files created. So the three mandatory plus the .prj. One of the biggest disadvantages of the shapefile format is that the field names are limited to 10 characters. And that's a limitation of the DBase format. So that can be a problem if you are exporting from something else. So if we look at this project, we've got this layer here and we're showing the attribute table and it's got these these two columns population growth and population density so those are two long field names and let's see what happens if we export this uh, it's a feature class as a shapefile and to do that we just right click on the layer go to data and export features and the export features tool will come up and if we export it to a folder as opposed to a geodatabase, then it will be saved as a shapefile. Once that is saved out, it will be automatically added to the project. So we've now got the same data, but in shapefile format. So let's open the attribute table to see how that conversion has happened. And we can see those two fields population density and population growth. But so it complies with the 10 character format, it has just cut off those two words and we sort of got population one and two. So it's no longer clear what these two fields represent. So that can be a problem if you are exporting data sets into the shapefile format. There's also a file size constraint on shapefiles of two gigabytes. So shapefiles are not really very good for very large data sets. And Esri eventually introduced the geodatabase and feature classes as their main vector data format. But geodatabases are not public domain in the same way that shapefiles are. And virtually every GIS and cartographic software package support shapefiles. 
And shape files are simple, they're easy to use, they're easy to share. So this is going to be around for a long time to come.